So I think probably everybody knows this, but Kirby had to duck out um, this afternoon. So he asked me to run the meeting. So I said, yes, I apologize in advance. I haven't really done a ton of prep on this because I wasn't expecting to do any, anything with the meeting really, um, but it's pretty straightforward. So I don't think we'll have a big problem with it. Um, does everybody have the agenda in front of them? Okay. Uh, this is called the order for the October 26, 2020 Montpelier Planning Commission meeting. First order of business is approval of the agenda. Everybody take a look. Any comments? Do I have a motion for approval? Move to approve. I'll second. Thanks, motion by Barb, seconded by Marcella. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Sorry, jumped the gun there. Opposed? Extensions? It's approved. Uh, next is comments from the chair. I don't have any. So next is general business. Uh, is there anybody from the public that's on this Zoom call that would like to speak about something that is not on the agenda? Hearing none, we will move on. Next is to consider the minutes of our last meeting from October 13th. Uh, does everybody have a copy of those minutes in front of them? Uh, I'll give a minute for people to look over them really quickly and then we'll discuss if we need to. So Aaron, is Ariane on? Yes, I am. I'm just eating, so I'm going to leave my video off. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. All right. I used um, to be I, <laughs> I did look at the minutes and I move approval of them. I looked at them earlier, so. I, okay. I just have a question. I wasn't there. Can I just add, or do you want to discuss them? Um, sure. After I think your motion? Start with Pardon? Sure. Um, under the section on the potential zoning changes, it just, um, the commissioners were not ready to decide tonight. We're not ready to decide what, um, do you care if it lists the two options that were under discussion? Um, or do you think that fully describes the conversation, the discussion as it went on? I had to leave like midway through this, but I, I don't, cause I had to go to the, um, CVRPC meeting, but I don't think there was part of the thing was the list of the sections that are troublesome so that to the development plan would be provided to the commissioners. That would be helpful. That sentence, I think that was part of the reason why we weren't ready because things were sort of written in multiple places and we didn't have like a thing to decide on. Mm. Yeah, I think there, there was just, there was just a lot on the table and I, I don't think, I think it does capture sort of the feeling of the commission. Like yeah, the, I don't think it was it. A or B. Yeah. We just didn't want to decide. It was more like things were not ready. Exactly. Uh, so we have a motion from Ariane to approve. Do we have a second? Yes, second. Thanks, Marcella. All those in favor of approval? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Minutes are approved. Uh, now we get into the substantive part of the, today's discussion, which is uh, first off is a discussion of the potential zoning changes as requested by the Sabins Pasture Development Team. Um, I think as Marcella alluded to, there was a number of sort of outstanding questions that we had that we had not quite settled on any sort of, we didn't have any real action items, I think in, in front of us at the time. Um, so if it's okay with you, Mike, I think you might be the best to sort of bring us up to speed where we are and what next steps might be, if that's all right with you. But if it's not, let me know. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, so the thought today was, you know, we'd heard a lot at the last meeting uh, from, uh, from the development team about what areas might be problems. 
Um, and then we kind of had a long discussion, went a little bit into the history of the PUDs and what we had intended and what city council had done. And in the end, um, we kind of left it open to go through and say, let's wait till this meeting to have a more detailed discussion amongst the planning commissioners about what we wanted, what direction, what questions we still had, what direction we wanted to go. Um, and really it, it, in you know big box terms, we kind of had three or four options. Uh, you know, one is just to leave everything as it is. Um, another one was to uh, change the PUD language to help out in the areas that uh, Doug had I identified as problem areas. Uh, the third option would be to kind of remove the requirement, change that applicability line to remove the requirement that they have to go through a PUD and make it optional. And then the fourth is to come up with some other suggestion that, that might come through there. So there are really kind of these four boxes we could move towards. Planning staff can't sit down and start drafting something for a public hearing until we kind of have, a, have an idea of which direction the commission would like to go on, on the overall idea. So, you know, the, the idea today wasn't really to necessarily get into, you know, to have a, another presentation from the members of the, excuse me, of the, of the development team but rather to have us kind of talk about it and see what our questions are and where we're at. Um, so I guess I could kind of leave that there and see what people are thinking and what they want. We do have a couple of people. We do have Dan Richardson and we do have Alan Goldman. And I thought I saw Doug was here as well. Yep. Right. So we do have a couple of members. If there are questions for the development team, they are here to, to be able to answer those questions. But um, I guess it's really to kind of start getting the thoughts of where the commission is at. Right, and, and before we kind of get into that discussion, um, and I don't want to put Dan on the spot too much, but uh, Dan, I think I remember at the last meeting you had offered to maybe have some proposed language or or something for us. And I don't know if, if that had ever happened. I was just checking to see if we had anything to offer the commissioners at the meeting before we have this discussion. If not, that's totally fine. I just wanted to sure, check. I, no, I don't I don't have proposed language in part because I, I understood and I apologize if I misunderstood, but that the chair was uh, sort of uh, cold on that idea, at least at this juncture that he wanted uh, the commission to have a discussion about it. And yep. that he would, he'd be happy, you know, I, but that said, I'm happy to draft proposed language if that will help move it forward. Obviously, it wouldn't be tonight. It would right. be. No, thank you. I, I just wanted to check with you because it, it was a little unclear of me from my part at yesterday's meeting or last two weeks ago where that had landed, but that, that's totally fine. So, um, yeah, so I think, you know, I don't have. You know, unfortunately, you know, it, at the last meeting, I was fairly agnostic in terms of, you know, weighing the options. And so I don't know that I'm the best person to sort of kick off a discussion on this. Um, uh, so if Mike or anybody else would like to sort of start things off, that'd be helpful. I'm just going to be honest, I'm probably not the person that's helpful in starting that discussion. Um, well, I'm sorry I couldn't make the meeting last time. I inadvertently scheduled another Zoom meeting that I had to actually host last time uh, on Tuesday. Um, but I did go through the um, video and, um, and now through the minutes. Um, and there are just a, a couple of things that, you know, regarding the new neighborhood PUD, I think that, that it was drafted. And John, you can help me with this because you were uh, part of that comment team that worked with Brandy on this, um, that the idea was to help to direct development for larger projects, um, potentially like Saban's Pasture. But um, part of that kind of, as, as Mike pointed out last time, part of that kind of got um, 
derailed, I guess we would say, by some of the changes made to the zoning districts in that area um, by city council during the public hearing. So um, it does seem that I would be, well, I would certainly be very hesitant to make significant changes to um, the new neighborhood PUD because of its ramifications down the line. Um, so, but I do think that, <clears throat> so I think that the cleanest way for us to approach this and the way that might cause the least delays uh, in terms of the, the process, the zoning process would be um, to modify the section uh, on the new neighborhood PUDs, uh, 3404B2, so that it removes it as a requirement, but still leaves it as a recommendation to use the new neighborhood PUDs for projects over 40 units. So in a nutshell, that's sort of what I took away from the meeting uh, video from last time. John, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so I wasn't able to make the last meeting either, um, but um, I think that summary in terms of uh, changes made by city council maybe created um, some issues for the um, um, the PUD um, and really the intent of it. Um, it was an attempt to bring together um, the various stakeholders and get to the um, get to the essence of what the real concerns were around which were really around um, design and um, access to certain parts as opposed to uh, this idea of it, it was it wasn't helpful just to you know have this this number, this density number thrown out, you know, 100, 200, 8,000, like none of that really meant anything. So to get some kind of assurances around what this development would look like, um, and it's very hard to try to legislate good design, but I think this was the Planning Commission's best, uh, best attempt at it, um, that being, those items identified in the, the the PUD, and that a certain um, a certain percentage um, would be set aside for uh, if this was a large development, a certain percentage would be set aside for uh, recreation or access. I don't know if you got the chance to, to see the video of the last meeting, John, but the, a couple of the, I guess the, the issues that kind of came up with that or the dis conversations in a box where um, the, the PUDs were kind of designed as a balance between um, if, if, if we wanted to have increased densities, then a developer would have to meet higher design standards. And that was kind of the balance and the discussion that was going on for the PUDs. If people want to meet higher densities, they've got to have higher design standards. And what we have here is a project that does not have to have higher design, does not need any density bonuses, but because they're going to be doing more than 40 units, they're going to have to meet those higher design standards. And uh, so, so they have all the, all the sticks and don't need any of the carrots. So, that was one of the questions that came up. And then some of the design provisions that were in there um, would not, in the opinion of the developers, you know, create the best design. Um, for example, orienting, a requirement to orient towards the road would mean orienting towards the, um, the private road, which would eventually be a public road, but that Asia Drive would be running north south so the buildings would have to face east west as opposed to say facing south to berry street um so they end up with some design problems that, that architecturally and they felt they would have a better product 
if they didn't have to orient to the street because they could orient to Berry Street that's a little bit farther down. So, and they had a number of little examples like that where there are some things that subtly, um, uh, how you could, if they were gonna have parking under the building, there's a requirement that the garage doors be set back eight feet. And so they end up with this weird situation of how they integrate that into a building where they're building into the landscape. And so they had a few of these examples that they went through um, from the PUD standpoint, um, just, just to get you up to speed as to where, where some of the conversations were uh, about the, the, the PUD and where that, those were hang, hanging them up on their projects. Thanks, that's helpful. Yeah, I found that really helpful, Mike. I was really struggling to kind of understand what some of the issues were last week, to be honest. Um, but I, I think I'm, I think I'm in favor of what um, Barb suggested, which is removing the requirement, but making it a recommendation. I guess my question is, are there other reasons people would do PUDs then? Or I'm not well versed enough in the zoning to quite understand that. Well, part of the intention was always to be able to allow them to have higher densities. So that density bonus seemed to be a reason to do it, um, an incentive for, as John said, for good design um, on the part of any particular proposed development. Um, I suppose that, you know, that's why I would say, I don't think we should remove this section entirely but leave it as a recommendation rather than as a requirement. Yeah, and that was a, a little bit at the end of the meeting last, last time, we had a little bit of discussion of one of the things to, to watch for if we were to, to let's say, say weaken some of the requirements because, you know, they don't get all the, they don't get any of the carrot, they don't need any of the carrots. So let's just take away some of the sticks and, and keep some of them was that the, the bonuses are still there and there may be other parcels and other properties in the city that may want to do a new neighborhood development. And if we remove some of the sticks, they may get the benefits without having to meet the sticks because we took them away. And so we, we really felt that if you're going to have densities higher than the surrounding neighborhood, that you meet that higher level of design. And, and that was in, and you know, in 2016 and 17, when we were really going through these PUDs a lot, um, we were kind of pulling, pushing and pulling amongst ourselves and, and, and with the consultant when she was on board about these, because it is, you know, in the big picture, how do we set our zoning densities was one piece. And um, you know, one, one theory goes, you set the densities a little bit lower, um, you know, less density, and then you put in these incentives, which would go through and say, if you wanna build more, then you've gotta to build to these higher design standards. Um, you know, another theory just goes and says, we'll just put, build in those higher design requirements right in at the start um, and set your densities where they are. And we kind of, you know, pushed and pulled among ourselves to go and decide how to weigh this out. And, and we ended up with our, our, you know, pretty much setting the densities to match what's on the ground today. That's our 90% rule that we talked a lot about. And then have these PUDs, if you wanted to have something um, greater than what the surrounding neighborhoods have for, for whatever reason. Um, and some of the requirements in the PUDs are things like, well, I wanna have a higher density, but it's gonna be senior housing. It's like, oh, okay, well, if you're gonna do senior housing and you meet a higher design standard, then you could have a higher density. Um, and that was the intent of Sabin's Pasture. We had actually zoned it all residential 6,000, which is you know about seven units an acre. So the project they're proposing now would not be possible. So they would have to do a new neighborhood PUD in order to get the benefit of the um, 
the increased density. Um, but the city council later on went through and rezoned Saban's pasture to have a high density area at the bottom and a low density area at the top, which kind of meant they have plenty of density to do what they want to do. And we had also built into the subdivision standards and built into the design standards a bunch of architectural requirements and a bunch of other you know, requirements that everybody has to meet anyways. And so the question starts to come up, you know, which is where we're at right now of, do we still require this PUD? Um, because they don't, they don't need the benefits. Um, but there may be other, as we said, other, other neighborhoods where somebody has a piece of land that they want to build. Um, and it may be, it's probably going to be a much smaller, this is a unique parcel being as big as it is. There's only two of them out there that are really, you know, maybe three that could support a large development, but we may get somebody who's got a much smaller piece of land, maybe two acres and would like to increase something from 18 to 24 units, you know, something like that. Um, they may decide, I'd rather have the 24 units. I'm going to do a PUD that has these higher standards. In any, in any case or whatever we do, I think it would be good if we do keep this optional or not, maybe just to take stock and clear out some of the things that are either especially problematic or that, you know, we can do without. Sometimes I get, or I feel like, you know, theoretically, we can add a lot of these things and we know they're good design elements like, you know, grid streets and orienting things. But if ever you've tried to build anything in Montpelier, you know, the topography is such that like it, having a, a perfect grid and, and having it perfectly oriented is, is not necessarily a luxury that um, that we have in, in, in our, our landscape here. So there's probably too much stuff in here or um, yeah, regardless of, of whether this becomes required or not, let's take the opportunity to, to make it better if, if we do have some feedback that's, um, that's helpful there. Well, John, you and I are going to continue to argue about this probably forever. Um, but I think we went over these very carefully when this section was put in place. And in fact, I think that most of these for almost every site could at least be um, accommodated. Most of the requirements that we put in, and there were reasons that we did it because you know if we're trying to maintain the character of our of our traditional neighborhoods, then we want to create new neighborhoods that have some element, some of the important elements of traditional neighborhoods as well, and that's really what the new neighborhood PUD provided, and over and above what ever the requirements are for subdivisions and site plan and everything else. So, um, I mean, I did go back and look over the whole section today. And I still think that, you know, we um, provided some carrots and some sticks. I mean, one of the other carrots, I think, wasn't it, Mike, that they could actually even increase their footprint um, up to 18,000 square feet. Um, as part of the, the dense, so-called density bonus. Um, so there are other carrots in there as well, but um, it doesn't seem that the sticks, the aspect are, are very onerous and actually could be accommodated. So, um, I mean, the whole intent here, at least when, when I thought that we were working on it, was uh, to basically keep this, you know, any new proposed, development in sort of accordance with the traditional patterns that we've established in the city. Yeah, and I don't, I don't disagree. And, and I haven't gone through these and don't have anything, you know, the, um, the street layout just came to mind, but I, I, I didn't have anything specific in mind. And it may be that, I'll, you know, we did spend a good amount of time on this. So it may be that, that, um, that they're okay, but if there is an opportunity to improve or that we do get feedback and that we all think like, oh yeah, you know, maybe, maybe that would um, help improve this, that, that, we, um, that we act on that. But uh, I didn't have anything specific uh, in mind. 
And in this case, I don't think we want to necessarily string these, this group, these people along, you know, with the idea, because that's a process that could take a long time, that if we could provide some kind of uh, simpler relief that we still felt comfortable about, that we, um, by making it optional as opposed to required, then to me that makes sense because they can move forward and then if we chose to revisit the PUD, we could move forward with that too, but it, they wouldn't be reliant upon it. Sure, but I, if they have feedback on how we can improve things, you know, we, should, we should welcome that. Well, I mean, again, and uh, you know, I don't wanna go into de designing their project for them, but I don't think that there is any of the requirements that could not be met. Um, with with care in terms of how it was it was placed, so um, and it may be that there is some um, difficulty when you have a project like this defining what is the street, um, and uh, that I think that came up several times at the meeting last week was I mean or last time was is the new Asia Drive the street or is Berry Street the street. And though actually that's the kind of thing that, that maybe we could more clearly define and that would help. I think this project, this property ended up being a little bit trickier. We did talk about the new neighborhood, you know, um, potentially applying to this at, when we first talked about it. As they've moved forward in their design, uh, they really have basically identified a single um, place, <clears throat> excuse me, that the road could fit. Um, so as, as you said, there really can't be a street grid because the hill is a little bit more than, um, is, is more than eight or 10%. So they're kind of forced into this one location for the road, which means if they want to, fit a certain number of units um, because they're, you know, we've always talked about having a majority of the development in the, in the lower part of the pasture. We don't get the advantage of say, looking at this in the same way that a college street or something else might fit in with um, a number of single family or two family or four family homes tucked up tight against a, a, a small public street. It just isn't gonna necessarily fit out that way because we, we could do it, but we would get substantially less number of dwelling units. Um, and so what has been proposed is, you know, if we're looking for, you know, say more units, more affordable units, then what we would need to do is to group them together. So it's gonna be a little less of a quote, traditional um, new neighborhood development, just because we, we can't, we don't, we can't build more road you know, normally what you do is build out more road, you'd make a number of small lots, you'd put them in on a grid, and we would mix, um, you know, one to four unit housing, plus some um, larger, you know, maybe up to 12 unit houses um, in, in, in along the main artery. But as it turns out, it just, it, the parcel doesn't lend itself to that. So it ends up looking more like having fewer eight to 10 larger structures that could house, um, you know, more, more units per structure. Um, and that'll be a little less traditional neighborhood, but it's what is going to fit on this, this parcel because of the topography and because of the floodplain and the wetlands and the, um, and, and the challenges that are there, it kind of has to fit into this other box that isn't traditional neighborhood. Mike, did, did they indicate how many total units that they were talking about, or just that it was over 40? Uh, I, I don't have an exact number, but it would be more than 40. In the past, we've talked about, I feel like maybe John said this, or maybe Kirby, I can't remember, but we in another thing we were talking about, when you just recommend something, it's as good as not really being there. So I, do you see us running into a problem 
switching this to these two recommendations rather than requirements? Is there still a reason for it to be there as a recommendation? Or is it is it the the incentives that you get? It's a recommendation and you get the incentives. Or if you don't do it, you don't get the incentives. Is that my understanding? Yeah, I think the proposal is is not to make the requirements in the PUD optional, but to make the PUD optional. Once you're in, then you're gonna have carrots and sticks. You, I see. You, know, you have to have the requirements. Um, but right now, if you are in the city and you're in a certain zoning district and a parcel of a certain size, there's, a, I think, three, three things. And if, you're, if you meet those three things, then you have to do a new neighborhood PUD. So the one option is let's take that requirement piece out and then just go and say, um, if, if you want to take advantage of these um, density bonuses, then you would have to meet these other requirements that are in here. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Do we need to make a call tonight? Are we, were we gonna get, I don't know, I missed Kirby saying he didn't want the stuff written down. So I'm, uh, what do we do? Uh, well, there's, it would be helpful if we could make a decision because I still have to go through and put together a, a formal proposal. Um, if we are going to warn a public hearing, then I've got to warn everybody at the state and regional planning commission and all the abutting communities. Plus, I'm going to have to send this to everybody who's in this in in this neighborhood as well. Um, certainly, city council is going to expect that we reach out to them to go and say this is the proposal. Here's a copy of the strikeout proposal, and we'll have a really big Zoom meeting to get public comment on what they think of these. Um, these changes. So um, it would be good if, especially if it's a fairly straightforward, um, you know, let's just remove the requirement, then that becomes a fairly easy process for me to move forward on. And again, the planning commission can change its mind based on public input, based on just thinking about it more, but we just need something in the same way we did Pioneer Street, we need something to go through and put in the public hearing so we can start the ball rolling. Um, and then from that point, we'll make decisions and move it up to city council or, or it dies in the public hearing, but that's, that's a little bit of where we're at. So in an effort to move this along, um, Aaron, if you don't object, um, I could make an emotion to, um, suggest that we move forward with changing the requirement for a PUD for the new neighborhood PUD to a recommendation. You'll find no objection for me. Um, okay. <laughs> but I think, and I, I know you, you cited to the specific section in oh, yeah. the regs that I think it'd be helpful if we had that. Part <laughs> that of would be good, wouldn't it? Yes, it's... Um, yeah. Section 3404B, subsection 2. To remove the requirement for a new neighbor PU, neighborhood PUD, we could determine whether that was just for the Riverfront District or if it was for all the districts listed. That's the only question left in my mind. Do we make a blanket uh, removal of a requirement and make it a, a recommendation for all of those districts? Riverfront, Western Gateway, mixed use, residential, residential, 3,000, 6,000, 9,000, 24,000. Right. I mean, maybe, maybe at this point in order to keep this as narrow as possible. And given the obvious constraints of the Riverfront District, 
that we yeah. make this for riverfront only. I feel like that's a good idea. Western Gateway. Yeah. That's West. Yeah. That one feels big. Yeah. Can, can I make a quick suggestion here? Um, are we, do we have some clear, do, do we feel good about what Barb's motion is right now? <laughs> if we do, I'm looking for a second and then we can discuss the motion. Can I amend it first, Aaron? Sure. It hasn't Because I don't, I now, it, you know, as we got into it, I wasn't clear. Yeah, um, no, that's, it, that's fine. Yes, amending section uh, 3404B2 to remove the requirement for a new neighborhood PUD for the riverfront district only. Okay. Now, do we have a second to that motion? I will second. Okay, second to Marcella. The motion's question. on the floor, <laughs> open, yeah. for, open for discussion. So I, I have a question. Um, so the applicability right now reads allowed in riverfront, et cetera. Um, and then it's required for parcel for over 40 parcels or for um, parcels that is 10 acres or larger that's not located in urban center. So I'm, is it still allowed in, in riverfront? It's just not, it, riverfront doesn't have to meet this sub bullet too. Yeah, I think it would. Do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah. yeah. It sounds like we could add later in that sentence, you know, and is not located in the urban center one riverfront or entirely in the rural district. And then it would just leave it optional for riverfront, urban center one and rural districts. So what I'm confused by urban center one even being in that part two because it's not allowed. It's not in the allowed list. It's not even it? allowed in in urban center one. <laughs> Oops, that might have been one of those edits that never happened. <laughs> I'm in favor of making it optional, but I feel like unless I'm missing something, I I would want to make it optional for all districts because then I feel like we're just respond. I don't know, we're responding to a particular development and I thought the way we were talking about the PUD it, I don't know it didn't seem to make sense for other reasons I guess I do have a concern about kind of shaping zoning based on particular developments that are coming up not that this doesn't sound like a great development it just seems yeah I don't think it's necessarily this development but it's the district itself that Riverfront is a is a tough district um, with its proximity, obviously, to the river and setback requirements and things like that, that give it a lot more constraints than some maybe some of the other districts do. Yeah, and the other way of getting at that would be to go through and take each of the requirements and say, well, unless the topography doesn't allow you to do that or. Yeah, but it, and I'd even argue about that one. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I agree, Ariane. I don't like the idea of making it, making, you know, a change just for one project. Right. I think the, the concern, though, is that the Part of the reason this is a problem is because city council changed savings faster to rural. So that's part of the reason that this is even an issue based on the open space requirements um, for the PUD, which, so you, you can't have both of those things within this parcel. It doesn't, I mean, you, you could, I think it would be hard to meet these requirements within those constraints. Um, but I just, I keep getting, that just keeps popping up, popping up in my head, excuse me, because it's such a, it, that makes it so challenging for this to work specifically within this riverfront district, but it's only relevant to this parcel. Is it only relevant to this parcel? Um, Mike, can you think of any other parcels in the riverfront district that this would impact? Because of how number two is worded, there are other projects that could get caught up in it. Um, 
it, it is looking at either 40 parcels or dwelling units, which I think I've pointed out the dwelling units is, is a problem as well, because somebody could take, um, you know, one of the granite sheds or another parcel that's at least two acres in size. Um, or I guess it's gotta be 10 acres in size. Yeah. So yeah, is there, yeah, I don't know if there is another parcel. There might be, I'd have to, I'd have to look to see, but. Is there even another parcel that's 10 acres in size? Um, yes, you're gonna have, it, w it wouldn't necessarily be in, in Riverfront, but you no, can but have it, yeah. a couple of the rural parcels um, what's called Stonewall Meadows, um, which is off of, up behind um, Berlin Street. Um, there's yeah, the I guess I, I meant any, property. anything else in the riverfront that, you know, might um, be 10 acres or more. Because the, the ones you mentioned, I think, could benefit from this. Um, but they're, and they're not in the riverfront district. So it sounds like it comes down to this parcel is the only 10 acre or larger parcel in the riverfront district that this could even pertain to. Is that right? How many acres is this parcel again? Do I think know? they identified 11, right? It's 11. 11 and acres. For looking at the map, it looks much larger than everything else in Riverfront. But yeah, it's, that's, that's it, is, it is the biggest. It is, it is the biggest in, in Riverfront. So. Um, and is the entire parcel in Riverfront, Mike? No. No. Part of it's in, and that's part of the problem too, is part of it's in river, uh, river, um, riverfront and part of it is in rural. 15 acres of it is in the lower, uh, the higher density riverfront. And then the other 85 are in rural, um, which becomes an issue which, which we haven't talked as much about, but it is also um, the issue is that the other part, which is not being proposed for development at this time, um, has a required conservation subdivision that has to be up top. And that has become a challenge because there's no, no real discussion um, of how these two PUDs are gonna actually interact with each other. So staff recommendation has been to strike the requirement in both of those and make them both optional, but. But, but the parcel that's associated with this particular project is how many acres? A hundred. Oh, it's a hundred acres. Okay. I misheard last time. Yeah, it's, but it's this is, but the riverfront piece is only a small portion of that. hundred acres is all of Saban's pasture, right? Yes. No, not all of Saban's pasture, but all of this part, right? It's not the entire pasture pro par property, excuse me. The entire parcel is approximately, I mean, we're talking ballpark numbers, around 100 acres is the entire property. 15 acres is in the lower portion, which is riverfront. 85 are in the rural district, which includes the, you know, the top of the pasture um, and, uh, you know, where the, where the slate quarry was and, and out towards all the forested area on its way out towards the golf course. So they're not proposing to separate this parcel from the rural parcel up above. There will be a subdivision at some point. Um, I would assume there's going to be a subdivision because there's, there's going to be, you know, eight eight to ten buildings there. I would assume they're going to subdivide and put those buildings onto separate parcels. But um, I guess they could make it a large condominium project. But there'll, there'll probably be some subdivisions in there.
Well, I guess I don't really hear a compelling reason why I, I mean, I, I understand um, that this parcel is different and I guess I'm not personally like hearing a compelling reason why it has to be required for other um, districts, but if, if other people don't agree with me, it's not like a hill I'm gonna die on. I'll, I'll vote for changing it just for the riverfront. It does seem as if this is a pretty unique parcel in the city as we've always identified and certainly difficult to build on. Honestly, though, we'd probably get that same complaint. The Western Gateway too, steep also. I don't think there are any easy yeah, but places the, to but build. Parse potentially easier to build because of other, you know, they're really hemmed in here, but um, to uh, keep it out of really steep slopes. But anyway, um, I mean, I guess I just go back to the original intent of the PUD in the first place was to try and direct the development in larger parcels that still remain in the city to um, towards creating uh, new neighborhoods. And this one is certainly difficult and it wasn't originally our intention to treat it this way, um, but it changes that happened as a result of the public process um, ended up putting it into Riverfront. So I'm not, um, I guess I'm, I'm hesitant to make it apply to all of the other ones without looking at each one of them individually, at each one of those uh, particular of districts and determining whether or not we thought it was a good option. So in terms of narrowing this down and keeping it as minimal as possible, um, I guess that's why I'm proposing just doing it in the Riverfront District. Any further discussion? Oh. All right. Um, Barb, would you be so kind as to make your motion one more time so we're all clear about what it is? Um, and I guess the, the, the kind of the procedural question I was going to ask is, is this a recommendation to staff um, that we're making so that they know what to draft going forward? Or are you thinking of something else? I think it has to be a recommendation to staff, right, Mike? Yeah, I mean, at this point, it's just the, the recommendation for how we draft it, so. And why don't you read back to me what you have? Uh, what I would think the proposal is, is to amend 3404B number two and to re fix, fixing two things at once removing urban center one and replacing it with riverfront. So therefore require this uh, PUDs would be, this PUD would be required for any development of 40 parcels or dwelling units or more in a 10 year period on a parcel that is 10 acres or more in size and is not located in the riverfront or entirely in the rural district. You can take rural out too. It's not allowed in rural. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> all right so there we go should we um invite any any public comment i know we have people here representatives and for voting on things if anyone has stuff to say or add we just have project people associated with the project right al and dan doug the rural you may want to keep the rural, there's discussion in part one about yeah. if you're partially in a rural district. And so it was a distinction between entirely or partially in a rural district. So 
Sorry, that bulldoze, whatever you guys were just talking about. I was confused. But yeah, number two makes it required for any parcel entirely in the rural district. And the conservation subdivision one later on is also required. in the rural district. So we would actually have two of them required. But that wouldn't pertain it to projects pertain to that are located, project. yeah, to projects that are located in both districts. Um, all right, so what you're saying, Mike, trying to get this clear, Aaron, um, is that B2 should read, um, for any parcel that is 10 acres or larger and is not located in the riverfront or entirely in the rural district. Is that correct? Yeah, although now I'm, I'm looking back at part one and I'm still confused what is or isn't allowed in rural because it's not listed as allowed in the first sentence. And then it says if the proposed new development includes land in the rural district, so does that mean it has to be partially within one of those other districts, but include land in the rural district, in which case it would never be entirely in the rural district? I'm just, that's all very confusing. Oh, oh that's <laughs> true. <laughs> How many times can we conflict with their own? A little bit of that. Mike, why was that piece, if you remember, the additional piece about the rural district included in section one? Uh, I think it was to reflect that we did have a couple of parcels. For the most part, we tried to put parcels entirely in one zoning district. And every once in a while we have a, a, a parcel that is just so big that it crosses into two districts. And we wanted to be able to have some discussion of that. Um, So I think that's where, where that one kind of came from. So actually, does that mean, I guess, so this is an example of that. This is an example of a property in Riverfront that includes rural, the rural district. Um, so it's, it looks like that only, sorry, I'm, thinking out loud as I'm talking. Um, I have the same question though, Stephanie. It's, yeah, so, it's, so it looks like it's, it's me, only counting. Sorry, go, you go ahead. I can, so let me, let me explain that. So number one is just allowing something to happen. So this property does have land in riverfront and it does have land in rural. So let's say just for argument's sake that um, the Sabins Pasture Group wanted to put 400 housing units in the lower pasture. They're only allowed to do 350. So they need the extra density, which is from the rural part. So they could pull their extra 50 units out of the rural. Um, they can't do a new neighborhood in the rural, but they can steal the density from the rural and bring it into this other riverfront district. And that's what that provision in number one would say, okay, if you mm. want to do that, this is the applicability, if you want to have that, well, now you have to meet all the requirements for the dimensional use site, street design, all through that list. Now you've got an extra set of requirements if you want to transfer density from rural into the riverfront. Okay. Um, in this case, they're not, but... That, that's where number one would come in as an option to that. That makes sense. So my follow-up question to that is then, so one of the issues we were running into that we talked about last time um, was that the, the planned unit development requires a certain percentage of open space. Well, couldn't this requirement also say if you're adjacent to something in the rural that contains that open space, that that could count in the same way that you're using the density from that property? Do you see what I'm getting at? Instead of so instead of taking it out, we can say you can count that space as because it's part of this property towards that requirement. 
which is which sort of fixes the issue of city council taking it out and putting it in rural, which is what caused that issue in the first place and made the two not get along. Is anyone tracking with what I'm suggesting? I'm missing it. No. <laughs> um, Sorry. Can yeah. I just, uh, Mike, can I just back up real quick? I, I understand what you're saying with respect to sub one, but I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around how that solves the inclusion of the rural district language in sub two. And I think I'm missing something, but I, I, I don't no, think, I think that's also still a problem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that can be removed entirely in the rural can be removed. I think occasionally drafters try to go through and explain something and by explaining it, they actually confuse it, you know, so if it's entirely in rural, then it doesn't count. Well, it, it didn't count anyway. So why are we talking about it? Well, I just thought I would tell you that if it's entirely in rural, then it's not required. But um, by mentioning it, I think it makes it a problem. So it really should be struck because it's not relevant. The entirely in the rural district section yeah, of that, two? Yeah. Okay. So hypothetically speaking, and I'm not trying to derail this discussion, I just want to make sure that we're moving in the right direction. Let's assume that we make the change to sub two to replace urban center one with Riverside district and strike the, or entirely in the rural district language. If, if, that, if everybody's on board with that, my question is, does there need to be any sort of change to sub one to, to capture the discussion that Mike had just a minute ago to sort of clarify um, kind of the role of rural in this applicability. Because if we're here and look, looking at it right now, we might as well do it, but I'm not yeah. sure. I think it's good. I think number one is okay. okay. I just, I think that the two options you have before you, the, the motion on the table is just to apply the requirement or just to exclude from the requirement riverfront district. And then the other option would be, which is not on the table right now, would be just to strike number two altogether. Can I ask a general or, planning question about that? Yep. As I'm learning still is, I mean, so part of me, I mean, I think my first feeling is like, we should just be very narrow about this because this is a unique property and uh, for all the reasons we've talked about, but then is that just perpetuating the same sort of problem that spot zoning perpetuates? Buy into the assumption that every property is unique. Yeah. But this um, is the only property in Riverfront District that actually meets all of our criteria in terms of being to make, you know, anyway, I won't go through all the criteria, but um, so it does seem as if we are addressing it only to this project, but in fact, this is the only project that qualifies. So if we leave it as a requirement, then this is the only project potentially in Riverfront that it would affect. Correct, Mike? Yes. So it's spot zoning in and of its, you know, in, in the other direction, it's a spot zoning requirement as opposed to us. I'm, I'm glad you brought this up though, Marcel. I think, I, you know, there's there's a lot to look at here. Well, in I'm that case the, though, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna, I'm not the attorney, but I, I probably wouldn't have considered it spot zoning, but go ahead. Well, if, if that's truly the case, if this is the only property in Riverfront that this is applicable to, then we would, I think it would be easier just to remove Riverfront from number one. I, I think, so there's nothing over 10 acres other than this. Is there any opportunity within Riverfront for 40, par 40 dwelling units? That's not this property? Yeah. But okay, so then it's not just applicable to this. No, but, but it's, it's this is the other. only one that's 10 acres or larger. Right, but it's so an or, it's either 40 units or 10, or 10 acres or larger. So there could still be properties that in Riverfront where this is. is. Yeah, like the one next to it and one of the um, yeah, the sheds, granite sheds. 
Is that an or? I think it's, I thought I always or, read that as an and. It is, it is an and, I believe. It is 40 parcels or more. Um, the only thing that does start to come up that is a little oh, bit of jogging my memory is the parcel that is right next to it, which is part of that same field. Um, it's the land that used to be owned by VCFA is larger than 10 acres, but the portion that is in riverfront is not 10 acres, but the parcel itself has some, it's got three zoning districts as it goes up. The lower portion, portion is in honey parcel. Riverfront. Is in riverfront. And if they were to locate more than 40 units, they would be put into the, they would also be put into this. Um, but I think if we're, if we were making the change that Barb suggests that would fix it for both of these parcels. So um, that's one question. Getting back to Stephanie's question about what allowed in riverfront, the allowed in riverfront, any parcel which is at least two acres in size has this as an option. So there may be other parcels that may want to be a new neighborhood, but is a sm but is a, as small as a two or three acre parcel. Um, and if they want to get the density bonuses, uh, then they would have to meet those requirements um, down below. And some of them may not be applicable because a three acre parcel may not be building any roads, but they may trigger getting into it for, for other other reasons, but they'll have to meet these higher site design requirements. So I would probably leave Riverfront in one because there is a lower threshold that's allowed and a higher threshold that says, if it's a big parcel, then you must do this. Got it, no, that makes sense. Thank you. And I guess the only, I guess I would, I would call it a, a just a, a thought, um, to, to entertaining these every every district that comes up is whether or not somebody would you know let's say we've got a, a parcel that's 12 acres in size in a residential 9,000 district and they're looking at a project and they decide um, you know we were going to do 60 units but we're going to have to do a new neighborhood you know because we're now, we're, we're in the exact same discussion we're having right now about Savings Pasture. They would be having because they've got a 12 acre parcel, they want to do 60 units. We've got two options. We could make this a 39 unit property uh, and move forward on our project, or we can do the 60 unit, but we've got to wait for a zoning change. And um, that's going to add another three months to our process. And we've got to go through and convince the planning commission. The question is, you know, what are the, what does the developer do? Do we end up losing development potential in order to avoid, a, you know, an administrative process um, by making it a requirement? When did it become a 15 acre parcel? When oh, this did is, it, yeah, the, the town you just said that it's a 15 acre parcel. No, he's doing a, a what if, this is a imaginary. Yeah, I was doing a what if uh, because we've just fixed we've just fixed this. If we hypothetically just do the riverfront, add the river riverfront in there and make that exemption. And as Barb was saying, we should look at these on a case by case basis and decide whether to remove that district on a case by case basis. And what I said was, well, what if there's a 15 acre parcel in residential 9000 neighborhood and somebody comes in and is looking at a project and then decides, you know what, it's just not you know, it's not worth going through a zoning change in order to do the 60 units. I'll just do 39 units and avoid this hassle altogether. Um, it's, I mean, most of these are highly unlikely, but again, it's, it's another- well, Why wouldn't they just use a new neighborhood PUD in that case? I mean, they wouldn't have to ask for a zoning change. If it was, had a lot of steep slopes and most of the land wasn't developable, or if, you know, for, for whatever reason, like I said, it, it really comes down to, um, I don't expect there to be a lot where this is going to apply, but anytime, anytime I see a, a limit, I, I always, you know, uh, when I look at Act 250, 
you know, they'll have a limit that'll say four, well, you know, up to 40 units. And I will guarantee you there are a number of projects that get done at 39 just to avoid going through Act 250. And if you bump that up to 75 units for an affordable project, you'll see people coming in at 74 just to avoid Act 250. Um, so anytime I see thresholds in here that go and say 40 units or 40 dwelling units, um, again, we're talking about dwelling units, not even talking about a subdivision. Um, you want to put in a, um, a senior housing project with 60 units, you know, it might be easier just to go through and make it a, a smaller project at 39 units to avoid the added hassle that it's going to take to do this. Um, and I guess, I guess like I want to know, and it's still very unclear to me, like, what is this added hassle? Like, how did this become Act 250? And, and can we like annotate the new neighborhoods to get a clearer understanding? Like, where's the heartburn coming from? And can we adjust those? And, and I think that that should happen regardless of um, whether or not this is required or not. But um, like, it's, it's still, it's still, uh, I don't have a firm grasp on what's not, uh, I won't say possible, but what's not, um, you know, what, what would this project not be, not want to, to make? Is it, you know, half of these, all of them, some of them? So the there was a whole list. We went through, there was a list. And I think, I thought at one point we'd asked for, to see that list and that would still be yeah. helpful if we can see what the yeah. list is for this project of exactly what those pieces are um yeah. for that large i think that's really important yeah that might be a lot of work for them to do um i mean if it was all they already had the, the list, list i thought i can go yeah. i can i can go review it i in the documents yeah. that we have in the minutes there's really nothing there no you have to you have to watch the video and and alan goldman and maybe Doug as well went through it um, piece by piece, but rather than getting into the, the guts of the, that particular PUD, at least in this case, um, it seems as if we could table that for a later discussion, John, and just handle this one now um, by determining that because of the way that the zoning is written, right now, this could pertain to this particular project only in the Riverfront District. And so perhaps what we should do instead is to ex uh, exclude it, to modify it in such a way that to remove the requirement for new, new neighborhood PUDs for Riverfront, but still allow it because there are other properties that might want it. So if you want me to give you one example, John, um, just real quick. So um, point E number two, so that's talking about uses says, the development shall include a mix of housing types, including both single unit and multi-unit structures. And no more than 75% of the dwelling units may be of the same type. So in, this example for Sabin's pasture, that would mean they would have to be um, making 25% of, at least 25% of the units would have to be single family units. And that just wasn't gonna be, you know, logically making a lot of sense for the, the project that they were proposing. And I think, so I think that's just one, one of the examples of, of the types of rules that they were talking about. Well, it, it really, if you're going to say it, it, we shall do this and we have to put in 25% single family units, then that's going to make this project much, much worse than, you know, it, it's not as good a project as we could do if we were maximizing our development on the lower part of the pasture. And the, the, he went through a number of these. Um, that was, that shall one have Mike a, was probably. That one was probably the most significant. I think the other ones had a lot to do with particular design that that um, could have been accommodated. But in terms of the mix of housing types, that one was pretty significant. 
Yeah, shall have a, a, a defined streetscape of uniform setbacks with build two lines on each block. And, um, you know, we talked a little bit about how the buildings are not, you know, going up a hill at that angle. It, it doesn't necessarily make for them the best, they felt the best design. Uh, shall be located to the front of the parcel in relation to the street, both functionally and visibly. Um, Yeah, so they just had a, a bunch of them that were kind of in there. Sidewalks on, um, they felt sidewalks would be required on both sides of the street and they wanted just sidewalks on one side of the street, a couple of those types of requirements. And access to parking as well, having parking, the parking yeah. on the lower, visible from the lower side of the site. So there were, in that case, there were a lot of requirements in the new neighborhood PUD that were specific to that project that they couldn't, felt they couldn't meet. Um, so um, it makes me reluctant to make big changes to the new neighborhood PUD um, in accordance with the problems expressed by one particular project. Um, if there's another way to handle this. Right, so I think we can still vote on what we what you've proposed today and that might still make the most sense. I still wanna see that list and I think it's gonna be helpful for the future conversation on what, what these rules should really be. That's a more in-depth conversation, but I still, I don't think that means we shouldn't make the simple fix today. Um, and then have the public hearing on it next time. But I think before we do that, it's helpful to have a full sense of exactly what the issues were. And I don't think it would be hard for them to pull together. They were reading it off of a list. So I think they already have it. So I'm confused, Stephanie, are you saying that you think we should go ahead and vote to exclude Riverfront from the requirement? Yes, although that vote means we have another meeting to talk about this. It's a public hearing. Right. I think, so I think voting, I'm comfortable voting on that today. Yes, oh, you're, but I still yeah. think it's worth going back and taking a more detailed look at these regulations. And especially with the, the line of thinking that Mike was taking, um, which is sort of a, a, a disincentive for density when this is really supposed to be the opposite of that to some degree. And I think it's, it's, I wasn't around when these were drafted, but I think it's worth having that larger conversation. But if we go ahead and say, propose that the riverfront district be removed from the requirement, then this particular development team has no reason to propose the list of changes. See well, I think I mean. they already have the list. They already have it, right? I don't think it's a lift. I think they already have it. Yeah, but it. that list is specific to their particular design. And I it's, understand you know, that. Yeah, but I think that's, that list tells us what some of the issues are with it. Yeah, I don't expect them to do an analysis of how this is going to impact any project in the entire city. I think that would be our job to do. If they have a list of how this impacts their project, then, then that would be helpful for us to have as just information going forward. But just a list without any, mod any suggestion of modified language, right? We don't want to get, right. we don't want to pay the attorneys that much money. Yeah. Um, no, I'm definitely, I'm not looking for anything new. I'm looking for what they already have because they were, what they were talking okay. about at the last meeting. Okay, uh, it sounds like we may be at a point where we can vote on the motion. Going once, going twice, if anybody has anything else they wanna say. Can we just ask, make sure that Mike rereads the motion now so that we're clear? Absolutely, that sounds Thanks. very so, good. <laughs> so my proposal is just to take 3404B2 and replace urban center one with riverfront and strike or entirely in the rural district. 
So number two would read required for any development of either 40 parcels or dwelling units or more in a 10 year period on a parcel that is 10 acres or larger and that is not located in the riverfront district. Good by me. Marcella. Yeah. I okay. <laughs> Unless there is any other discussion. Uh, all those is in there. The um, What's that? Any, any comments from the project team since they're here? Yes. That's it. Yeah. Uh, Dan? No, no, there's, there's no comment. You can go ahead and vote. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all those in favor of making the recommendation as uh, stated by Mike, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? It's approved unanimously. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Alan. Appreciate your time. Uh, we will speak with you again, I'm sure. So, I'm sure we will. Thank you very much, all of you, for your thoughtful discussion. You're very welcome. Uh, and with that, I'm sorry, I need to go look at my agenda again really quickly. I think uh, next is uh, revisiting uh, or providing an update to the transportation plan. Um, we have done sort of a preliminary review of it, but it looks like there's been some updates. Um, I know we have Hanif is here from the uh, transportation committee, um, but I think probably the best thing to do to set the table would Mike, again, you're probably in the best position to do that at this point. And then obviously I like to invite Hanif to uh, provide any insight that he might have and then we can uh, have a discussion. So what you have, what I sent, um, which has some comments on it from me, um, was um, what they, what the transportation committee had approved. Um, and then I tried to give you a little bit to give you some context into some of the conversations we've had and some of the, um, uh, some reasons why this looks a little different than some of the other projects. Um, so what you see in italics below the goals was really um, where they had gotten um, these, they had worked on it for a long time and really kind of jockeyed around with a lot of options and things. And it took a while to kind of hammer this down into shape, but where they got to from strategy standpoint was to, um, and you'll notice the first one, maintain sidewalks and crosswalks in excellent condition, including snow clearing in winter. So that was their, uh, basically their strategy, but it didn't fit our model of what a strategy was. So I went through and added strategies to kind of flesh that out. And then they approved those afterwards. So this kind of helps hopefully to give you a little bit of a sense of why things look a little different. Um, I wanted to leave them in so you guys had the context of what they were trying to do. Whether we keep it or not is, is gonna be up to you, but that's really a little bit of the thought. Um, again, this was a, was a um, they took a much, you know, not much different, slightly different approach to how they did things. Some of the, you know, we, we've generally been pretty clear about, you know, maintain, evolve, transform, or continue, amend, new. We, we, you know, we really kind of were very plain and kind of hit those words exactly. They tended to um, go a little bit more, you um, implied, you know, um, rather than being explicit about their goals. Uh, try to think of some of the examples that they had in here. Um, public transit will be more convenient and available as opposed to a lot of times we were talking about, you know, um, in, improve the convenience 
and availability of public transit. They, so they tended to just kind of word things a little bit different, but I think it's all there and I think that was good. Um, and so I think, I'm just trying to read some of my notes real quick. Um, so they divided them up a little bit differently. Again, I put a number of notes in there to try to help give you guys some information of, of what I was thinking. Uh, you and I, had, or we had had a conversation about the fact that they had framed some of theirs as, as like walking in Montpelier will be safer. And that was kind of meant sidewalks and those pieces. And we had a little bit of discussion about um, you know, kind of the equity issue and whether walking was the right word that we should be doing and if we could come up with wordsmithing. And, um, but I think, I think their intent of what they want and their priorities of what they, they think um, is all here. And I think we just might have a little bit of work to, to massage these to get them into a final form that's consistent with the others. Um, but I guess I'll leave it there and see if you guys have questions. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Um, I just, unless anybody objects, I think maybe you, since we have Hanif here, um, I think it might be helpful to, or it might be sort of welcome to help sort of couch this. And I see we have another member here um, today. <laughs> and uh, very, Hi. very happy member. Um, yes. I just wanted to say, uh, I wanted to maybe give Hanif an opportunity to, you know, provide some, some comments to us before we start asking questions. Um, I just wanted to say, Hanif, thanks for doing this. It looks like, you know, obviously there's a lot of moving parts to this plan. Um, looks like a lot of good work went into it. So that's very nice. And, uh, Luckily, you won't have to compete with the small child now that they're off the camera. But I just wanted to give you an opportunity to, to make some comments, if you'd like, Henny, before we before we start. Um, hi, can you hear me all right? Sure can. Sure can. Oh, great. Um, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, and thanks to Mike, I think he's given a pretty good representation of the process that the committee and the subcommittee went through. Um, I think we have, as a committee, reached a point of fatigue um, and, and really very clear that we would not want to give a lot more comments or shape things any further without really understanding what the Planning Commission sees um, in the draft that we've presented. And also you're in a much better position to see not just the issue that Mike was raising as the format and the differences of, of the way that we've approached aspiration, goal and strategy, but also how this relates and cross references with the other chapters of the city plan. And particularly the energy, um, chapter you know given that transportation is actually uh, you know a has a huge impact on emissions and um, should relate very closely to energy and also a lot of the work and a lot of the the, um, the goals that we're outlining relate to to the built environment uh, and housing uh, and land use. And so there is this sort of interconnection, which you have much better uh, overview and um, understanding of relationships. So as a committee, we've kind of hit our, you know, hit the wall really with, um, you know, trying to refine the plan. And I think we're re really, act, you know, very keen to hear back and have feedback back from the Planning Commission. Um, and so I would really, I would really say, um, you know, we would welcome your viewpoint of how are we starting from the top with the aspirations um, and the goals and not so much um, 
the strategies that Mike has put in that would make these, you know, more implementable and realizable, because we are assuming that those are fairly dynamic and will be reviewed. And, and if this is actually a, an eight year, five or eight year plan, then presumably strategies are going to be evolving and responding to changing situations. So really the, the goals and what Mike was saying, we were calling strategies, but actually are worded more as sub goals or kind of arching over uh, a cluster of strategies that Mike has put in as implementable you know, actions that the city can take. So um, we've, we've kind of stopped at those sub goals that are arching over the strategies. And we then proceeded to, um, to look at prioritization. Uh, and again, I think we would like as a, as a committee to go back um, before a, a, a process of public engagement to really be or have more inputs on, on the prioritization. But really after having your feedback and having a sense of what is the final, uh, what will be the final look and content um, you know, coming back from the planning commission when you've actually had your discussions and put things together. But I hope we will have that opportunity to indicate some more priority. I think Mike has already put in, um, you know, initially uh, as a pre preliminary, some of the priorities that, that we came up with in a very quick and dirty uh, sort of vote um, you know, voting sort of uh, process. Um, and that voting process was also uh, included a consultation with another city committee, the Complete Streets Committee, who have obviously a mandate and a lot of interest and a lot of overlap with the content of the transportation chapter. So we have, there has been some liaison and some consultations, which I think you, you know, as a planning commission, you should be aware of. Uh, and, and, and very limited um, engagement of complete streets committee with the voting process. And that's partly why I'm saying we would really welcome back an opportunity um, to, to put in some more input on, on the prioritization. Uh, and I think that the prioritization as uh, as sort of um, highlighted, uh, Mike has put in, you know, under the strategies is actually more, from my understanding of the process and my reflections on the process, the prioritization has been actually much more effectively done at the level of our sub goals, what we, what he called our sort of our attempts at strategies. So that's really where, particularly with complete streets, where the voting on, on priorities was, was done. And I think it, my own opinion, um, so I'm just speaking individually, is that putting priorities on, you know, we have a hundred or more strategies there, is not really very, very effectual. Uh, and that really the, the goals or the sub goals, prioritization is a much better place if you are as a planning commission interested to know from the committees and from the public engagement, what are the perceived priorities? I think it's more at a higher level than the strat individual strategies, the implementable strategies. That was, a, that was a very long, I'm taking opportunity, that was a very long answer. Uh, I'll stop there, but I'm happy to, to expand or clarify. No, that's very helpful. I appreciate you know you giving us insight into how the committee you know arrived at what we have in front of us. And again, I I want to thank you and the other committee members for doing what has clearly been a heavy lift. And I can only say that I think most of most of our commissioners can appreciate the uh, 
the fatigue that can set in with something like this. So um, again, thank you very much. And uh, I think to your to your point about providing additional input and prioritization going forward, um, you know, I, I think the discussions that we've had here at the commission, um, we all envision there being multiple points of you know further input, and you know, we we we're going to welcome that going forward. We'll certainly work with your committee and all the other committees uh, to help sort of shape this, refine this, synthesize these different chapters in a way where we can come up with a truly comprehensive document that speaks to the sort of interdependent nature of a lot of these the subsections. So um, again, thank you very much. And with that, um, you know, I guess I would just sort of open it up to the group uh, for any observations, questions, and I think if we have Penny here and, and, you know, he can answer any of the questions we have, I think that'd be helpful. So I'll just sort of turn it over to the group. Um, I'm, I'm just going through these, the document right now and sort of taking, you know, taking it all in. Um, so kind of open the floor. Go ahead, Barb. Here. Um, yeah. Thanks for doing that, Hanif. I think that really helped us get a better sense of, of the overall approach on this. Um, and it, it does seem that there are some that are, you know, some of your aspirations or your sub goals even are similar. So perhaps it won't end up being quite as many strategies as you indicated. But one of the questions that came up for me as I went through this is if you had to put it into one or two sentences, what would you say was the overall intention? What does your group want to accomplish as a result of putting, putting together this plan? I can probably jump in on that too. Yeah, um, go ahead, Mike, if you'd like, because I think you, you have been at all our meetings and you could represent the chair on, in this instance. Yeah, I think, I, I think the big picture of, is really captured in aspiration A. And I think there was, you know, there's some, there was some challenge. I mean, this, this is a, uh, you know, um, unlike some of the committees that we've, we've had um, work on things, you know, the, the historic and the housing and the, and the energy, I think the um, transportation committee was, uh, you know, a, a little bit more divided among where they're coming from and where they're approaching approaching this. There's, um, but they were all pretty consistently interested in making it easy to live and work in Montpelier without a car or without owning a car. And I think that was the big thing they, that, that was pretty uniformly accepted there. Um, where things started to divide among the group was there's, you know, a, a group, a small group that perhaps would want to have no cars in the downtown and really kind of go in that direction of, of you know, aggressively moving in that, um, in that direction, while the other group was a little more pragmatic of saying, you know, with, you know, 9,000 workers and, you know, uh, you know, 4,000 people work and drive to work in town that, you know, we have to address cars, we have to address it to a certain extent. And so I think that was the, a little bit of the push and pull, but it was pretty uniform that we wanted to, it shouldn't be a requirement to own a car. Um, if you want to live and work in Montpelier, um, that doesn't mean you have to, you know, not have a car, but at the same time, it shouldn't be a requirement. You should be able to find places to live where you can access public transportation, access um, shared mobility, um, uh, micro transit, other places that would go and say, look, I can live here and not own a car and I can get everything that I need. And I think that was their overall vision was um, to meet that objective and to kind of build around that, that model. Um, and, and that, that's where I would probably say was the, their, the biggest piece. Can I, can I add to that? Yeah. Um, or maybe qualify. Uh, I'm not sure if I entirely agree um, with Mike when he says there was a polarization um, and there was that view of not having cars 
in Montpelier. I think everybody's been pretty pragmatic. And um, I think the difference is that it, it comes from around the level of investment in transportation infrastructure. And we've had, I think, 100 years of heavy investment in highways and, and really accommodating the car, uh, including right you know, downtown. So I think it's, it's, a, it's uh, the committee's, I think Mike is very right that the committee overall, the balance of the members' feelings is it's time to rebalance. And it's really, I mean, I think that is the term that's the, you know, a fairest term to describe it. It's time to rebalance and particularly to think about the CIP, the you know, capital improvement plans and recognize that very small, you know, in terms of per capita spending, very small amounts being shifted to, to, to pedestrian and bike infrastructure can make a huge impact. And I would, I would put forward from the many meetings that we've had that safety, you know, the goal that keeps coming up and the word that keeps coming up, it's safety um, is really key. I think the, pro the, the issue is that walkers, you know, don't have sidewalks that are safe, particularly in the winter, that bikes, uh, you know, are, are really, I mean, bikers are really not using the roads because they don't feel safe. You know, children are not going to school on bikes because, or parents are not feeling good about that because we don't have the appropriate infrastructure. And, you know, it's a recognition that we are progressive in a lot of ways here in Montpelier, but we are behind um, in those terms in the, with that infrastructure. And I think the, the COVID-19 and this, these last past six to eight months have actually reinforced that as people are having to be out more, um, they've become much more aware of the environment. And so I would like to put that forward, slightly different, you know, um, slightly different perspective than, than Mike. I think Mike has actually, you know, uh, put it very concisely. And I'm just trying to give you a bit more textured uh, viewpoint. Um, I don't know whether I can share, I don't know how to share a screen here. Um, Should be on the bottom with the green. Share content. Is that working? Yes. Um, so, you know, in our prioritization process, you can look at, in terms of the numbers of votes, you can rank things. Um, you know, by goal. So I don't know if you can see the column A, the goal uh, A2 had the most votes. So that's biking in Montpelier will be safer and easier. So at the level of, of goals, you know, that was the top. Then the next one is walking in Montpelier will be safer, easier and more attractive. Um, then the third one is Montpelier's transportation system will contribute to a vital and lively community. Um, next is the system will support efficient movement of people and goods in a sustainable manner. Uh, and then moving around Montpelier will be safe for people using any mode of transportation. So I think that gives you a little bit more textured, you know, uh, sense of what, where the committee is at. Now, whether this actually reflects um, the perspective and the consensus in the public here in Montpelier or not, you know, we have yet to see. But I think that's a pretty clear message about that, I, that I'm trying to get across, which is it's about getting around, not necessarily with a car. Mike, thank you, you put that very clearly. But that's the essence of it. It's being able to get around and it's being able to get around if you live here in Montpelier, 
but also the people that come to work here uh, and play here, you know, our visitors and uh, the, our leaf peepers or whoever will come into town should have some options. Um, and they should have places to either satellite park and have shuttles or some other means, you know, bike paths, shared use paths, um, perhaps shared mobility and so on. So that's a sort of holistic view that I, I would like to try to convey um, that, that the aspirations, you know, that, that underpin the aspirations that you see, the aspirations A, B and C. I'll, I'll stop there. How do I get back to it? Would you be willing to share, to share that document with us? Because actually my question to you, and you just answered it was, was I was curious to see sort of, I mean, we can, we can, we can assign different priority levels within the document to the strategies that are outlined. But I was curious if there were certain areas in here that, you know, really got a lot of traction with the transportation committee and this document really spells out what those priorities are and I think that'd be helpful to the rest of us as we take a closer a deeper dive with the document to really get a sense of kind of how to weight the the transportation committee's sort of thinking and prioritization within the document that we have in front of us. Um, are you seeing this alternate shared view? Yes. So that's, um, that's a longer list. And if you'll see in the column A here, um, that this is going down to strategies that uh, Mike has helped us with, you know, the implementable parts. So there, there are several ways of presenting um, you know, presenting information to you in this sort of prioritized format, but also in this kind of slightly more um, concise and screen capturing way, because I think you have a nine page document um, laid out in a narrative form, which can be a bit uh, tiresome for you, I think, when you have so much to look at and so many chapters and so on. So I think if you're actually requesting us to share with you some alternate formats, then we could give you this kind of thing, you know, like a spreadsheet type of thing, um, which shows the whole, the whole nine pages just set out in columns like this. And, um, and then also ranked in terms of uh, a pro very provisional, very tentative, quick and dirty sort of prioritization, but it could continue to be refined with more uh, participation of members and um, other committees and public. So that, that will be my proposal. If you are requesting for, for that, then we would present you something in this more friendly, user-friendly format. Yeah, that, that would be great from my perspective, because like I said, I think it does a good job of sort of putting some granular context, you know, putting some granular detail in on terms of the committee's thinking in producing the document. And I think that'll, like I said, that, that context will be really helpful as we really dig into this document. So I, I would, I would be grateful if you'd be willing to share that with us. So. Yeah, you'd be uh, most, most welcome. Yeah. Um, right. I I think the other, if I can, if I can make another comment, I'm just very interested in the planning commission and the new processes for the city plan, which actually Mike has given us a lot of his time to, to get us deeper in to the process and, and understanding more that this is actually a slightly new process. And I'm coming from a, a kind of sustainable development background um, outside of Vermont and in like low resource countries and doing a lot of work in the health sector with planning. And uh, I have some reflections on this process, which I've, kind of, I've mentioned to Mike, and that is um, 
you know, whereas the city plan could be seen as something as just what are we going to do as a city? And that is sort of the shape I'm still seeing even in this new format. The, the background that I have would say that it be it should really be a much more uh, comprehensive and more collaborative type of plan. So Mike will often say to us, but that's not the city's responsibility. You know, so let's have a strategy that the city can actually implement. But my own, I, I'm very resistant to that because my own experience has been cities will really uh, thrive when they're co-creating and working with partners and collaborators, be they private sector or uh, NGOs or you know, community-based initiatives. So I was really, I'm really aspiring to see a plan that actually has um, a whole bunch of strategies that the city might not be leading but would actually endorse. So rather than saying this is not our really something we can do and given budget deficits and an increasingly kind of, you know, <laughs> difficult fiscal environment, surely this is the time to open up and say we have these goals and what we're looking for is uh, people to come in and lead or mobilize resources or whatever in order to reach those goals and not f and for the city to back off and not feel like it has to do everything that's in the city plan because as soon as you've endorsed as a planning commission and as a council city council as soon as you've endorsed the city plan it really it really um, empowers um, a lot of your, you know, your partners here, very keen and active, <laughs> highly motivated partners um, to, to, to come in, to actually come in and feel like this is a plan we can contribute to and we can, you know, this is something we can actually do. And I know from my own background that as soon as you have a holistic plan like that, you can, you can go to, whoever, whichever funder, and say, this is in the city plan and we are able to do this. Can we, can we, you know, can we, can you throw in some resources for us to, to, to do this? So that's my own, my very personal <laughs> angle. It's not the transport, transportation committee. It's a very personal angle, but I'm just taking advantage of um, this opportunity and my involvement in the planning process to put that to you as a planning commission. That's appreciated. Um, so we have about five minutes left uh, before we adjourn. Um, so I just wanna make sure that if anybody has any specific questions they wanna raise right now, now's the time to do it. Um, Cause time is running out, so. As we go through this process, Aaron, we'll be able to address further questions to the transportation committee, right? So even if we don't have specific questions now, we may be developing them as we go through this more line by line. Certainly, yeah. I mean, I think that's the, you know, one of the advantages of having the working group is to really do that deep dive sort of gather some more pointed questions to make sure that we're understanding, you know, their priorities and figuring out ways to synthesize those with the other things that we're doing with the city plan, so. Um, yeah, so I think having Hanif here and, and also the further information that he has will certainly help us in the, in the task force, subcommittee, whatever yeah. we're calling it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else from anybody at this point? We just sort of. Okay, well, I think this is a good introduction to the transportation subsection. And I'm sure, uh, Henny, if like you heard, we have a subcommittee that's uh, sort of a, sub, a working group that is dedicated to looking at this specifically. And we're going to 
obviously be taking a close look at it, developing some probably some follow up questions. So um, the process is ongoing. Uh, and with that, uh, unless there's anything else anybody would like to discuss, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Motion by Stacey. Barb, seconded by Stephanie. All those in favor? Thank you, Hanif. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. No. Hi. 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 <laughs> <laughs> That was my fault. I cut off the process. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't think we have any dissenters anyway, Erin. <laughs> right. Well, you got to, you know, we just got to dot the I's and cross the T's. So uh, all those in favor of adjournment? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.